I'm sure. Hi everyone, I'll... welcome to week eight. Eight. <laughs> welcome to week eight of the How to Survive Your PhD MOOC. And the talk this evening is about confusion. And it's going to be confusing because it's not going to be me talking, it's going to be the lovely Katie. And I'll be tweeting from behind the scenes. So I'll join you on Twitter on Survive PhD 15. And Katie is going to take over and tell you what we've got in store tonight. And tonight we have in the studio, I, aka my office, we have the lovely Margaret. Hey there. At Margaret Prestop. At Crystal. And then, and then Steph. You can yeah. only see, you have to stand up, Crystal. And we can, and yeah, Crystal's below. Yeah, make sure you I'm gonna, I can, yeah, I can't really she's, chill. She's great. She's here. I'm <laughs> right. shaking her. But yeah, she's she, anyway, she's there. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Katie. So take it away, Katie. No problem. Lots of love hearts for Katie. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will shame Crystal thoroughly later, so watch out for that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. My name is Katie. I'm at KTDIGC on Twitter, and I will be moderating your live chat tonight. So one of the things that we really liked for the week on confusion was that it was weirdly positive and really kind of happy, beautiful forum experience. So that was nice. It uh, was a big change from the fear and loneliness weeks that preceded it, where everyone just kind of sunk into a black pit of depression. I think we're crawling out of that now. Um, I also think that we've collectively grown a little bit smarter. Um, we learned a lot from people sharing their how-tos. Um, we learned about how to do different recipes, to how to do a hanging upside down on the flying trapeze, one of my favorites. How to do covert surveillance, which is very oh. apt in the metadata retention era laws of Australia. Um, and also how to write a ministerial brief, which we all also very much enjoyed. Um, so two posts that I really liked in particular were um, Easy Stress Reduction by Aurelia Nina. Thank you for sharing that. Some tips on how to calm yourself when you're having anxiety and uh, things on to kind of care for yourself in the future. And the other one I really liked was how to be and not to be a supporter for someone you love who lives with depression by Adam Rankin. Um, Adam gave a lot of really good do's and don'ts about how to uh, help someone, how to support someone who's living with depression. Um, and I like them because they um, focused on how to care for yourself and how to care for others, which I think is the one thing we've gotten out of this course, at least that I've gotten out of this course, that I have loved the most. Um, yes, easy stress reduction equals desserts. We obviously agree with that here because we have a chocolate problem. <laughs> um, so we'd like to give badges to both um, Aurelia Nina and to Adam Rankin, and also to at Splut, um, best name ever, for the flowchart, how to write a ministerial brief. We all got a big laugh out of it and also learned a lot. Um, and on Twitter, we have two more badges to give out on Twitter. Caitlin Cardetti for kind of working out loud through her confusion process on Twitter. And also Jacqueline Barris uh, for sharing uh, some great resources for us with us this week. Okay, so that's the badges. Congratulations to all the badge winners. Um, and uh, the topic for this week being confusion. Uh, there's a good few good kind of confusing things to talk about. So one of them is one of the themes that I noticed when I was looking through the forums this week was the difficulty in writing instructions for something that you know how to do very well. Um, Alibu noted this when describing how to cook with children. At the end, they wrote, it's interesting to reflect on this process and to realize it's not the actual steps involved but the guiding principles that are important. And I thought that kind of related a lot to supervisors who struggle with explaining threshold concepts. Um, it's not necessarily the steps of the uh, process, but the guiding principles that you want to impart. And Mickey Vale also found a similar trend when explaining how to click your fingers. And Mickey, I followed your instructions to the letter and I still, nothing, nothing is happening to my hand. Um, but what Mickey learned <laughs> from trying to teach how to click your fingers is, and I'll quote Mickey here, describing things with words alone is super tricky, especially when you're dealing with a physical action. The other thing is demonstrating what you're doing seems clear while you're doing it, but it looks completely odd when you're trying to follow it from the point of view of a learner. And when I once tried to teach someone how to do basic knitting, I found this for myself. I can just knit, you know, bind on, knit, Find off, it's all easy. When you show someone else how to knit, it just looks wrong and horrible and hard from their perspective. Um, and Mickey also said, it's very tempting to say, it's easy, but it's really hard to explain. And then especially when it takes them a long time to get it right. And the other thing Mickey pointed out was some things can't be taught. They rely on an intuitive leap from the learner at some stage. 
She points out in relation to herself, I followed my own instructions, but I couldn't learn how to click with my left hand. I just can't seem to do it, even though I know all the steps and even though I know how it feels like to do it with the right hand. I have no idea what part of it I'm doing differently. So even when I've managed to conquer a threshold concept, it's only in a limited context and I still have a lot more work to do. So that's kind of an interesting sort of a sort of reflection on how to give instructions and how it's a lot more complicated than it might seem, especially if you're already familiar with the material. Um, Kate Holmes, who talked about the threshold move on the trapeze, which is turning yourself upside down, um, she reflected that you need to do a lot of other things. You have to know a lot of other things before you can even attempt to hang upside down. So in this case, you need a certain amount of upper body strength. You need the confidence to know that you won't hurt yourself or fall off or knowing that falling off is okay. Um, so she kind of mentioned that to get to the next level, you need that confidence. You have to have practiced and you have to know that you might not get it the first time or the first many times. And the other thing that Kate pointed out is that you really need good support or a good spotter to make sure that you don't hurt yourself. So we could apply a lot of that to um, working with our supervisors as we get ready for a PhD to make sure that they, um, we, we give ourselves, we're patient with ourselves um, so that we don't uh, get really frustrated when we don't nail it the first time, something really complicated. Um, another similar theme was in Agnese UV's post about how to improve your English as a non-native speaker. Uh, she wrote, you have to practice it a lot. You have to watch a lot of videos. You have to put yourself out there, even though it's painful and hard. So this is when we're trying to master those threshold concepts. I, I kind of extrapolated her post to, um, to say, like, you're not going to get it the first time. You have to be patient with yourself. That's me. I tried to golf the other day, and I just stood there whacking the ground over and over again, going, why am I not Tiger Woods? Um, <laughs> I'm not good at being patient with myself. Um, because other people can make it look easy, but patience, practice, and so on will be uh, vital. And RMIT Jane, I'm really glad you're here tonight, Jane, because I'm going to read some of your posts recently on how to not understand, which I also really liked. Um, Jane did a fantastic um, picto chart, which I believe Inger is going to be tweeting yeah. out. Inger will be tweeting out in a second. Is that RMIT? I guess. Sorry, carry on. Yep. <laughs> There, I'm usually the tweeter, so I don't know what's happening yeah, over there. Yeah, I hope yeah. it's fine. Um, so Jane wrote um, that uh, it represents this map of how my guide on how to not understand represents the decision I made a while ago to not be anxious about understand not understanding. It's okay to ask a gazillion questions. It's okay to talk to the experts. You don't need to worry about looking stupid. You just have to want to learn. Um, very rarely the expert is condescending to you. Almost everyone is really pleased to be asked and keen to share their knowledge. So Jane wrote, and this is my favorite part, I celebrate my lack of understanding as an opportunity to connect with someone who does, and I think we are both better off for the connection. So I'm sending you a virtual hug, Jane. <laughs> there it is, um, because that was really profound, and I thank you for sharing it. So obviously being confused is a vital part of learning. Um, if you... Um, <laughs> thanks for the hug back. Um, you don't ever need to learn anything new if you're never confused. You have to be confused to learn new things. So um, help yourself. Ask the question. Talk to the experts. And as with most things in the MOOC, we are all learning together. So t we've just learned to not suffer in silence and to ask for help. <laughs> um, and for something lighter, I encourage everyone to check out Katie Tarara's how to waste several hours without even trying, which I am really, really good at. So there's another link there to another flowchart, which we uh, all found pretty hilarious. So if someone could tweet that out, that would be wonderful. Okay. Whew. So that's the kind of themes this week. Now moving on to the questions that were submitted. So the first off is a question submitted by Rasela. Rasela. Hope that's okay. Um, on dealing with contested narratives in your thesis. So this question goes... One of my biggest worries is that my research is based on a contested political narrative. How can I make my argument clear without it being dismissed because it doesn't align with the status quo and without me being accused of subjectivity? This is a really tough one. I spent a lot of time thinking about this question today. Um, contesting the accepted narrative can be really tricky. Um, it can get you in hot water with senior people when you are at conferences. If you're critiquing someone's work and they happen to be in the room, that can be pretty awkward. Um, but at the same time, 
you, these new ways of understanding are precisely what the PhD is about. Groundbreaking in a new field is part of the point of the PhD. You have to have an original contribution. So think of all the innovative researchers in your area that you look up, look up to. I bet they disrupted existing narratives. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, your research could be groundbreaking. So I encourage you to contest those narratives and contest them good. So a few thoughts on how to deal with this situation. Uh, my first thought was to lean back on your data. Whatever data you collect, or data, depending on your accent. <laughs> I don't remember which one's right anymore. Data, data. It's data. 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 That means that's wrong, so it's data. <laughs> Lean back on your... For my accent, it's data, like on Star Trek. Data. Okay. Um, lean back on your data. Uh, try to rely on your original research component to support your argument. Um, for example, you could say things like, I am contesting these narratives for these reasons, and I'm contesting it in this way based on this solid evidence that I collected. Uh, yes, Star Trek love on Periscope. Thank you. Star Trek is amazing. <laughs> um, I was watching it before I came here. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, to get advice from peers and people at different stages of their career on how to navigate this tricky situation. So. Um, some people from, on the spectrum from your PhD student peers right up to more senior academics and try and find some people in different spaces in their career and ask their advice. Um, they would be more familiar with your field than I am because I don't know what it is. Um, and they could provide advice on how to express this narrative in a respectful but still confident way. Um, I also think if you're contesting some narratives, you need to pick your examiners as carefully as possible. <laughs> Um, some people will be really open to having things critiqued and will be uh, sympathetic to your point. Um, other people might not appreciate that. So I know it's done differently in different places. So again, get some advice on that. Another thing I thought was to look for contrarian opinions early so that you can prepare yourself for the possible feedback you might get from your examiners. Um, on a, during my thesis, I posted a blog post that had a kind of contested definition of something and everyone immediately jumped on and told me how wrong I was and everything I knew was wrong and you're terrible. Um, it was painful at the time, but then because I knew that was the response I was going to get, I could write it um, to address that, basically writing with the criticism in mind. And the last thing I wanted to say is be confident. Be confident in your research, be confident in your argument. You're adding things, new things to the field. I'm sure you'll be amazing. Okay. Um, and Inger wanted me to point out, <laughs> I, found, I just discovered a note in my script, <laughs> that there are, risk for, there are risks for PhD students who st trouble the status quo. So there's a great discussion on Belcher and Trowler's academic tribes and territories. And then it says, for which, for which Inger issues a hashtag nerd alert. <laughs> and she will link to the academic tribes and territories uh, book. Is it a book? Yes, it's, it's a, a book. book. Linking yeah. to the book. Mm. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the other questions for this week was from Doc Pip NZ or Pip Bruce Ferguson on Twitter. Um, uh, she asked this last week, and I'm really glad I remembered to put it in this week's script. I hope you might address how to get how to deal with conflicting advice from your supervisor. It screwed me up a treat on occasion. I love how you said that. <laughs> I've been screwed up a treat occasionally too. <laughs> um, so. This is a question that I think Inger uh, um, hears. Uh, this is a question you hear a lot. Is that right? Yeah. How do I deal with conflicting yeah, feedback? Probably the second most common. The other one is when do I stop? Okay. Second mm. most common. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it also comes a lot with publication reviews, with examiners' reports, committee feedback. One person says I love it. The other person says I'm ho you're horrible and you should fail. Um, Inger wrote, "It's when I get this sort of feedback, I know I'm on the right track." So I guess that's a good sign. Um, so Jeffrey Kiever on Twitter, Kiefer, draws attention to research misalignment. And uh, you're going to tweet a, um, a link out about that one, um, which is about um, doctoral liminality as a conceptual threshold, which is such a good title. <laughs> <laughs> and she's also going to tweet out another paper on supervisor boundary management, so how to manage the roles within your supervision team from Anne Benmore. Um, so uh, with my supervisor, my first step was always to get them with my supervisor I'm talking about me now. because It's all about me today. Um, my first step was always to get my supervision team to talk to each other and decide what their official advice to me was going to be. So when they differed, I said, OK, I've received this from you and this from you. 
can we talk about that and decide what I should do and make it really explicit that I was only going to do one thing. <laughs> um, luckily, my team was all beautiful human beings. Hi, everyone. Um, and they worked really well together and they were happy to do that. I know that's not the same for everyone. Um, but there's some great advice on the Thesis Whisperer blog. How about that? Uh, so there's a few posts that I'm going to reference now. Uh, one post is from 2013 on just whose PhD is it anyway? So when everyone in the world is giving you advice, the advice from this post by Evelyn Cetas was to stick to your research proposal. Do what you need to do. It's your PhD. Um, somewhat conflictingly, uh, right after that in 2000, or a few years later in 2015, there was a post that conflicted with that advice. I don't know if you... We love to do that. Yeah, differing opinions. Like diversity of views. <laughs> diversity of views on the mm -hmm. thesis whisper. Alison Crump in 2015 said, your thesis is yours until you hand it in. And then it's a lot of other people's. Your examiners, the thesis committee, and so on. Um, so... Allison wrote that there are some pretty tricky power politics at work and you have to navigate them really delicately. So in that post, Allison's advice was, you're crafting not only your thesis as your own personal artifact, but you're also crafting relationships. The onus does not fall on students to manage this relationship alone. The supervisory relationship, like any relationship, is one that needs to be based on clear expectations and understandings of roles and responsibilities. Students need to be able to bring up issues and concerns with their supervisors. Supervisors need to contextualize conflicting feedback for their students and make sure students are not sent off with conflicts to deal with on their own. So that's very good advice. Um, another uh, post that uh, I've skipped ahead in the script and then back again. I hope that's all right. I'm just freeballing it here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just going with the flow. Um, another post from Pat Thompson was about managing conflicting journal reviews. And in her uh, blog post, which Ingrid will tweet out now, um, she writes that you need to take the time to clearly articulate why you're going to be doing one reviewer's comments and why you will not be addressing the other reviewer's comments. If you can argue why you're going to do one and not the other and kind of rebut one of the reviews that you don't think is appropriate, um, then you can do that. And of course, you can always get in an icebreaker, a third reviewer or someone like that, or calling the editor of the journal to um, adjudicate. Okay. And finally, and this is the advice I probably needed to read when I was in the middle of my thesis, you just need to bite the bullet and make the revisions as they are suggested to you because you're not always right. I'm stubborn, and when my supervisor said, this is wrong and you should fix it, I went, make me, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> So um, sometimes you have to swallow your pride and say, as you always say, anger in with anger, out with love. Mm. Quoting her now, just <laughs> getting her big head. I don't know. Um, uh, but sometimes you just have to, just have to accept that those reviews need to be done and make them, even though they're painful and horrible. But you don't have to like it. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead again. Um, so the next question was from an anonymous poster, and it really, it bugged me, it really, like in a, in a kind of I really feel for you sort of way. This, um, this poster asked a question that made me really sad, um, but I hope we can help now. So this anonymous question was, how do you remember concepts? Are there any tips to help someone that doesn't have a sharp memory? Do people ever keep notes and refer to them as they work, or is it just me? It's not just you. You are not alone. Everybody takes notes. Off camera, I'm holding 10 pages of prepared notes for this session because I can't just make these words happen. I spent a lot of time writing it and it had multiple people in this room assisting at all times. So you're not alone. Everyone takes notes. You should take notes. <laughs> you want? Okay, Margaret wants a photo. This is the script. And you can see the links are there too. Yeah, so... When I say they're going to be tweeting this link and everyone wonders how they tweet it that fast, they have a script. <laughs> and I've been deviating. I've been skipping ahead and going back, so I'm very bad. Okay. Moving on to the question. If you, unless you have a photographic memory, everybody takes notes. Everyone should take notes. Notes are important. Um, staying organized and managing the information overload was another theme this week. Everybody does it a little bit differently, but... Um, they are super, super important, and it's not automatic. Um, it takes time to develop that skill. It takes practice and organization. Okay, some recommended uh, ways to stay organized, okay? 
So starting with the best titled book I have ever come across in my life by Jacqueline Barras, who was recommended uh, this to us and has got a badge. Salsa Dancing in the Social Sciences, Research in the Age of Infoglut. I wish I was that smart to come up with a title like that. Uh, that's a book about staying organized and managing all the information that's online. So that Inger will tweet a link out to that book. And Pat Thompson, again, has a wonderful blog post. If you're starting your PhD, get organized now. Um, so uh, that's another um, post that will kind of get you started. Um, and the My Studious Life blog has a great method for a literature review matrix, which sounds amazing, um, which Inger has made into a downloadable worksheet just for your convenience, um, which she will share the link to as well. Um, there's another paper by Tara Brabazon. Brabazon? Brabazon. 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 We've got there in the end. Um, so we watched Tara in the first, I think it was the first week of the course, mm. on um, breaking, or on uh, supervision is like a marriage. Um, and so Inger's going to tweet a link to uh, her paper, which is about note-taking and controlling information. And she's also going to tweet a bunch of tips from this paper, which are all fantastic, and she will tweet them all to you now. Mm -hmm. um, Inger also recommends a workshop called Speedy Note-Taking which she will do the link to right now, mm -hmm. and shut up and write groups as a great way to steal techniques from others. And uh, by steal, I mean learn from. Thoughtfully appropriate. Thoughtfully appropriate, borrow, share, love. Yeah. Okay. Um, luckily, uh, there are tons of tools out there that can help with this. So for my own thesis, I used a really low-tech solution. I had a 100-page Word document <laughs> where I wrote down everything I had ever read with references and um, notes and quotes and page numbers and all of that. And by the end of my thesis, I could just hit control F to search um, and find the words that I wanted. So if I needed something about cultural studies, control F cultural studies, and I could see every time that anyone I had read had mentioned cultural studies. Very low tech, easy, anyone can do that. My supervisors also asked me to write briefing papers to them. Um, so they would say, when I was first starting in my first year, um, write one or two pages on feminist film theory, giving us an overview of how that relates to your thesis. And it ended up being a really great task in the end, because then I had one to two pages that summarized all of feminist film study that slotted nicely into my literature review. Um, so those are kind of nice um, things that you can do to organize some information. Now, I just saw some love for this on Periscope, thoughtfully preceding my comment. And Vivo is a great tool for coding and organizing data. Um, I used it to analyze my qualitative uh, data, and it's really expensive, but if you're using it for your thesis, your institution may provide it to you for free <laughs> on your work machine. Um, Kathleen McNiff shared a resource, which Inger will tweet now, on how to use Envivo to help your conquer writer's block. I love Envivo. I can't say enough good things about it. And of course, our old favorite, blogging. We love mm. blogging. Blogging is a fantastic way to organize your thoughts. Inger's going to post and tweet another link to how to blog your way to a PhD. Um, I love blogging. It helped me organize my thoughts and help people yell at me that my definitions were wrong so I could fix them. Okay, and a few more tips. There's so many productivity apps out there. Um, luckily, there's an app for that is what things I, I, I say that right. I've said that. Crystal, maybe I said, have I ever said that? Cool. There's an app for that. She's, she's not enthusiastic. That's fine. Whatever. She's mad I made her look at the camera. Um, <laughs> she's looking at me mean now. I'm going to stop. Um, there's an app for that. Here they are. Um, Evernote. Everyone I know uses Evernote for note taking. Um, it's searchable. Um, it's accessible on every device, on your tablet, on your phone, on your computer, on the web. You'll never be without your notes again. You can search them. Fantastic. Everybody should use Evernote. It's great. Uh, project management software like Trello or Basecamp, which are used for sometimes for projects at work, um, can be great to help you manage your thesis as well. Uh, Caitlin Cardetti on Twitter said, I use Google Calendar's task and note options and color coding to stay organized. Um, there's two links that are going to get tweeted out now to MIT Libraries, recommendations of apps for writing and research, and a different one from the University of Washington Library, apps for writing and research. There's a few different ones, so have a look there. Um, I'll just give you a few of my favorites. Uh, there is an app where you scan the barcode of a book and it writes a citation in the style of your choice. Yeah, <laughs> have you not heard of that one? That is, uh, that is QuickSight. 
it is amazing. So I'm just going to pick a book that happened to be in front of me. You just take a picture of the barcode. Um, anyone want to review that, please volunteer. It's great. It's like $1.99. <laughs> and it generates the MLA or the APA, whatever style citation. Um, there's another one called Easy Bib, which you just type in the title of the book and it searches the universe and tells you the citation for that book. Um, Scanner Pro turns paper documents into PDFs. So you just take a photo of a piece of paper and it turns it into a PDF for you with your um, phone or tablet camera. Um, I use Simple Mind Plus to make mind maps when I have thinking to do. Um, and um, don't forget the classics, the whiteboard, the post-it notes, the highlighters, the binders, the tabs, you know. Um, get in there with 150 different post-it notes that you can flip through and color code your work. Don't feel, sometimes you have to go back to the classics. Um, Excellent. So, um, uh, yes, we will tweet that link, um, SJ Gregory. We will do that. The link to all those um, different apps. Doing it right now. It's we being done. The... It's being done right now. It's magic. We didn't put them in. That's okay. So, mm. again, to scan the barcode, it's called Quick Sight. It's being posted. Yep. Mm -hmm. Easy bid. Yeah. Type in the title of the book. Scanner Pro. Simple Mind Plus. And I annotate for annotating PDFs. You're welcome, everyone. Beautiful. Okay. Excellent. So that pretty much wraps up the questions that we received in advance. Um, there's some high fives coming in. High five back. <laughs> um, does anyone on Twitter or on Periscope have any questions? Would someone like to sort of get the questions? Because I'm still doing these. Um, <laughs> I'm still doing these up. Uh, I'm just going to take a drink of water. Hold yeah. on one second. No questions? Uh, so I've got a question. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide which one of these cool to tools to use, Katie? Because they all look really super cool to me. They all do different stuff. Mm. Um, depends on what device you have. Those were all pretty much Apple, Apple, um, Apple apps, iPad apps and iPhone apps. I would say... Um, they're usually pretty cheap, like less than $5, and mm -hmm. it doesn't really hurt to try it um, and see if it works for you, because it might not work for you. So make sure that it does what you need it to do, and not what it says it's going to do. Um, any other questions? I'm just looking. Any questions? Apps for Android. Um, yes. Uh, great question. Yeah, maybe maybe Steph can think on that while we ask this question. I got Zotero last week. Should I get Evernote too? Ah. That is a good question. How are they different? How is a reference manager different from Evernote? Go. From Zotero, you mean? Yeah, well, Zotero or Mendeley yep. and Evernote do yep. slightly different things. They do. Go. So um, <laughs> Zotero and um, Mendeley are um, more like reference sharing software, and Evernote is a... The thing about Ever that Evernote does that the others don't do is the site while you write, which is, I know Evernote often messes up, but the site while you write is amazing. <laughs> you can just write the name like Smith and then click cite this and it will say, which Smith do you mean? Smith 1997? And it pops in and the reference goes in your bibliography. So for site while you write, which I don't think Mendeley or Zotero do, you have to go with the old classic EndNote. Um, if you want to be bookmarking websites and adding things from the web into a bibliography, um, Zotero and Mendeley are good. The other thing Mendeley does is it creates like shared uh, reference lists. So if you go into Mendeley and search, um, I don't know, cultural studies, you will get someone else's reference list about cultural studies that they've already shared. So let them uh, do the hard work and uh, tell you what books you should read in cultural studies. Um, obviously don't rely on that, but it probably give you a good place to start. So that's what Mendeley does. Does Zotero do that too? Yeah, um, to some extent, although you can sort of limit it sharing groups. Okay, someone says Mendeley does cite while you're right. In that yeah. case, use Mendeley. So Most of them do, Mendeley and Zotero, but sometimes look on YouTube. Okay, YouTube it. That's yeah. my answer for everything now. Yeah. Yep. Um, what else have we got? Um, there was a question. So Android apps, a lot of these work on Android, but I have an iPad, so I tend to use the iPad. Um, Evernote's on, on Android. I use it on my phone. I have an Android phone and Apple everything else. I don't know. Uh, Noe Lamas recommends Todoist. Okay, Todoist. Which I've just retweeted. Yep. Uh, Tracy recommends Zotero is a good alternative for EndNote if yep. you use Linux. 
Okay, if you're a Linux Linux user, is there any love for Linux this afternoon, (laughs) this evening? Um, Okay, Steph Steph is. There's a kind of brown and pink combo. Identify yourselves. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I would not think you want crystals in <laughs> <laughs> um, Someone just wrote no. <laughs> Thanks, Ch- Charles Knight says, my method is paper. I then take a photo of it and stash in Evernote, which I do as well because yep. it has optical character recognition. Awesome. So, yes, take a picture of a written page and it. Tracy says she's still looking for a good Zotero app for Android, however. Oh, okay. Mm, not so good. Yep. Um, tell the internet to make one for you. Okay. I, how do you tell the internet to make something for you? What's a good way to do that? I don't know. I just yell into the void. <laughs> Shout into the void. Blog post for you. Yeah, if you wrote a blog post about it, then I bet something would happen. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just looking back through my apps just in case people have asked me questions. Twitter, yep. Any other questions on Periscope? So EndNote, is, isn't EndNote the leader? EndNote is the established... Yeah, EndNote is like the Microsoft Word of reference material. Mm. Almost everyone uses it, but there's a lot of sexier options out there. I think EndNote's kind of the old workhorse. It's generally Um, also supported by the institution now. Yes, and your local information literacy librarians and research librarians can probably help you with EndNote, whereas if you're using something kind of a bit more out there, they might not be able to support you. So love your librarian, as always. Mm. As ever. As every post, every po- podcast or whatever this is should just end with, love your local librarian. Yes, and we've got some votes for OneNote. OneNote, okay. So those lovely Microsoft users. Yes, yes. And I Citavi. And Citavi, I hear good things about Citavi. That one Citavi. came up before too. Yeah, yeah okay, Citavi. great. Um, um, do we have any more questions, do you think? Any more questions? I'm going to put a last call for questions. Last call, okay. Love for librarians, thank you. That's uh, good. Um, yep. It's raining out there, I think. Mm. It's raining now, that's nice. It's been hot today. Um, Junie Tyan says, EndNote screwed up my confirmation report a couple of days before deadline to submit. I've had that experience with EndNote mm. too. Thank you, EndNote. You're dead to me. Yeah, um, there's a lot of EndNote dramas out there. <laughs> EndNote is like a beer when you're 18. It's hard to like it, but once you understand it, it's amazing. Oh, no. Oh, that's poetry. Yeah, it's poetry. That's beautiful. <laughs> Please tweet that to our favorite librarians. They'll love it. Um, I think that's it. It's yeah, 8.03. I think that's it. So next week we're doing? Boredom is next week. Um, boredom is fantastic. It sounds really boring, but it's actually fascinating. It's our favorite. I think it's yeah. everybody's favorite module is boredom. Yeah, we've upsold it now. So yeah, much. it's yeah. probably going to not live up to our expectations. <laughs> I like the history module. Okay, <laughs> Steph likes history, whatever. She's a, <laughs> she's a, she's a historian. It's fine. <laughs> All right, time to go. Thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I will see you guys on the flip side. Take care.